Okay then. Uh, let's continue. Um, great. So up till now, we've handled a few basics. We've handled a bit of the history of reinforcement learning um, and what it is. We've handled a few of the elemental elements yes, um, that you'll find and use within the course and within reinforcement learning in general. And so now we're going to sort of bring today to a close end with a few examples that will just help flesh out some of the ideas and topics I've presented. So the first one is we're going to stick to the maze example. Mazes at least are simple f to analyze these theorems to because it's simple enough for us to understand. Us, our little, at least my little petty brain can understand a maze. Um, it's nice and memory efficient and so it's great as a little way that we can teach everyone with. And it's also a great way to visualize some of the more complex metrics that we use to define problems that we're going to develop throughout this course. So I'm going to use a maze here, which is common, um, at least here we get this from uh, David Silver. And so here's our problem. We want to go through the maze. So we want to program an agent in order to, such that it can develop the policy to transverse the maze properly. So we'll go from the start point to the goal. Now what we say is that every time step, it receives a reward of minus one. So the longer it's in the maze, the worse its reward. The quicker it gets out, the better its reward. Um, at the goal, episode termination, um, the actions it can take can go north, south, east, and west. And the state is the agent's location in the maze. And so it's a deterministic problem. There's no randomness it, and there's no continuous state spaces. The agent moves with a single step to a single point. So when you talk about problem definition, we have simplified the problem quite a lot. So if you ever go and you watch these autonomous uh, rats, it was a few years back where they were using, you know, programming these little robots to get through a maze. Initially, they were all discrete problems, so it would solve it by going, treating each block as a block, and then the algorithms got smarter and they started continue, uh, making the problem set continuous. But for the moment, it's discrete. There's a discrete number of blocks. In fact, you can see the maze is uh, eight blocks by eight. So nice and easy. So um, here's using uh, solving the reinforcement learning solution that you can develop by policy. So what we have here is an example policy that will solve this problem. So regardless of where you are in the maze, there is an arrow which represents a particular action that the agent should use to accomplish the task in the optimal way possible. So in this particular case, if you're over here, the agent knows, okay, I need to go north, north, and then west, but it's all defined. So it's a predefined, and so this would be an example of solving a solution by a policy. Another example, if you wish to bring it out, and there's a a series of lectures that you can also watch by Sunton, I think his name is. Um, he published a set of lectures and he talks about how you can solve, for example, the inverted pendulum policy, uh, problem by policy, which is obviously a very difficult case because it's not necessarily able to re respond to disturbances at least that well, but it is able to learn and create and invert the pendulum. So that would be a case where it would learn regardless of, or where I am, there's a specific action. So you need to then populate the entire maze with said actions and policies. And so in this case, the policy is explicit. Wherever you are, whatever the state is, you follow action, finished. The next one, which is reinforcement learning solution by value function. So this is what we had earlier. So what the value function here is, is if I am in this particular state, how good is the state in terms of me trying to optimize it? And so in this particular case, the value function is, oh, sorry, the policy is implicitly available. So specifically, if I'm in this block over here, so where it's minus 19, the job of the agent would then be to say, okay, where is the best value function? And so it would have to do in somewhat to search through all of its discrete actions to find the value, the best value that it can get out of it. And so in this particular case, part of the reinforcement learning will be to populate this table with the value function. 
And so this is an example of an, ex of an implicit um, policy in that it's, we haven't defined the policy. The policy would then be to say, right, take the action which provides me the maximum expected value. Then there's a reinforcement learning solution by model evaluation. Um, so this is where an agent uses an internal model of the environment. And so the model is an estimate. Um, it's, it's inaccurate. It's incomplete. And the agent interacts the, with the model before taking the next action. So in this particular case, this is the example of what humans do when we look at a maze. Most of us, when we look at a maze, we try and we, we visualize the entire path. And this is the same thing of like when you're planning to drive somewhere. Say you want to go from here to Bielefeld. You sort of will plan your entire route based on, okay, I want to be there and then there and then there. In your mind, you've got a series of roads and maps and you're going to start going through all the different roads you know, as well as you might take into account your experience of, oh, I don't want to go along this road, there's too much traffic, or that road's a dirt road, I can't really go that fast. These are the sort of elements that would come into something like a reinforcement learning solution by model evaluation. Um, and so every time you want to take a step, you will reevaluate the model. And so in this particular case of the example, when the agent is over here, he will evaluate the entire model by going through and trying to figure out which way can it use in order to get to an optimal solution. Mm -hmm. Naturally, this model might not be fully complete. You might not know everything. For example, you might think, oh, it's minus three here. It, 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 it's not exactly a... It's more of a planning stage as opposed to an evaluation that we did previous, uh, that we looked at in the previous two examples. And so when we talk about general taxonomy, so the generalized um, different cases you can get, there's policy, so in terms of where you can go in terms of reinforcement learning, you then have these different solutions or algorithms which you can then apply. So for example, you can do pure value-based, uh, value function-based solutions, in which case you'll be using value-based techniques. You can do a value and policy-based technique, in which case you're going to look at things like model-free, um, other solutions such as actor critic, which if you want more information, ask Daniel. Um, I'm sure he'll be more than willing to tell you about all the benefits of that. Um, there's also policy based, so where you can make policy, and so your entire perspective or your, the goal of your agent is to develop said policy. So all of these come down to how of it that you're trying to get through the maze. And using those concepts developed previously or that we've shown previously, where for example you might say, okay, I want to populate my value function. So you will have to perform exploration, you'd have to then do exploitation, and combine a few of these techniques together that we'll cover in the next few months in order such that you can populate this in such that you can develop your policy. And so all of these different algorithms fall under the category of trying to achieve our goal. The question is what do we use in order to achieve that? And then when you combine the we and in this reinforcement learning course, we will focus purely on the value function and policy-based techniques. However, you are able to also include model-based techniques, which are elements of classical control. And so these, this is how generally, these are your general three ways of solving or optimizing a controller as far as what we will cover in terms of uh, reinforcement learning in the next 14 lectures. So that's the basics of reinforcement learning. That's, we've gone through, and so right now, what we've done is we've covered what does a reinforcement learning process involve. You've got your agent that's going to perform some actions, it's going to interact with these in an environment, and learn slowly through time and experience how to optimize its reward function over time by optimizing its policy. That's the basics of what we're trying to cover. Now there's ways of doing this. You can do this using value functions. You can do this using action functions. There's a, and policy functions or model techniques, which we're not necessarily going to cover. And all of these will come together in a way. And hopefully at the end of this course, you will 
have learned at least how to implement these solutions. Lastly, just because we are within a control environment, so an environment where we wish to control things, I will uh, do a quick little comparison between what we have shown up till now and model-based uh, control, so model-based predictive control, which at least some of you should be familiar with, just to sort of contrast the different benefits and disadvantages of both of these control structures. Now, both of them exist to a subtopic, which is optimal controllers. However, there are slight differences, and each has its own strengths and weaknesses. So, there are two fundamental solutions to decision making. The first one is the reinforcement learning approach, which is your environment is unknown. You don't know what the environment looks like. Your agent then interacts with the environment, does a bit of exploration. You're going to learn how to drive a car slowly. You're going to figure it out. You're going to build up that experience. And slowly, based on some reward function, you're going to improve over time and such that you optimize and get better and better and better at interacting with the environment. Planning, however, in comparison, is a complete a priori model of the environment exists. So you wouldn't necessarily use something like a reinforcement, agent, a reinforcement technique to build a building. You want a model of all the components, the bricks, how they interact with each other, the steel, how that interacts with the concrete, and you want to do, use all of this together and a model of the environment such that you can effectively build a building. If we did buildings with reinforcement learning techniques, it would take a lot and cost a lot as well. Um, however, with planning, you've got an a priori environment exists and the agent interacts not with the environment itself, but within the model. So if you, in model-based predictive control, the agent does actually perform some evaluations on that model, but in its own internal structure, whereas with a reinforcement learning agent, it has to have performed exploration in order to perform that planning. And the policy is based on the model feedback, and so there's what will happen is your model-based controller will look at the model and say, what is the best way that I can optimize my next step based on this model? So it's a lot of internal computation, whereas a reinforcement will look at, based on what I've done, what's the best next step? So the two these are two extremes of the same problem, which is, what do I do next? Either I look back to, what have I experienced? Or I look to, what is my model of things? And so, for example, when you drive your car, you could, for example, a model-based approach would be you first learn in a simulator, you, the simula using the simulator, you then f figure out how to drive a car, and then what we do is we sort of drop you into a car. So we replace the simulation with a car, and then as far as you're concerned, it's still, you're still interacting with that model in double inverted commas. It's, it's a loose way, it doesn't really fit. Uh, but it, it's, it's hard to describe the function, whereas reinforcement would be you get in a car without a driver, a, without a driving instructor, and you're sort of told if you crash your parent's car, they're not going to be too happy with you. And so you try and you do things up until, well, something happens. And so the, the cost benefits of uh, learning on data obtained from interacting with the system versus le uh, learning or iterating on a model based on its data, has its, each has its own advantages and disadvantages, and each can lead to an efficient and optimal solution. So each is highly capable. It all comes down to each one's strength. So a problem, a different way to think about the problem is the reward, um, so the reward hypothesis that we handled, one of the first things that we ha um, handled, which was what we're trying to do is we want to, instead of optimize the reward, a, um, a model-based approach would be, what we want to do is minimize our punishment or a punishment factor. And so we've gone from a maximizer that we used in reinforcement learning to a minimizer of a discounted, um, uh, discounted horizon. So the discounted uh, predictions and dumb inverted commas. So closed form solutions can be found. So if you've got, for example, a limited time invariant system, we have a very discrete model. You can develop costs using quadratic, and you can also consider constraints. Because inherently, because of that model, you know where the limits are. Because you can say, OK, I know, um, for example, 
if I know that I'm in a maze and I know step forward would advance me one position and I know what the map of the maze looks like, I can inherently figure out that there is a wall and there's a pocket. So if I go in that direction, I'm going to lose time. And so it can perform this evaluation. Um, however, there are arbitrary cases. So for example, it's not possible. And so what you try and do is, so for, a maze is a finite problem. We know where the end is. However, if you're doing something like a control problem where what we're trying to do is track a trajectory, you can say, yeah, I can, for example, with a rocket, I can calculate where the fins need to be at every point in time such that the rocket lands on the moon. But that doesn't necessarily lead to a rather time efficient or process efficient calculation. So what you might say is, okay, using what's called a receding horizon principle, I make the assumption that provided I've still got the same controller with a workable model, I don't need to go as far into the future. And this is an, an inherent optimization problem within model-based predictive control, which is how far ahead do you have to look in order to make these decisions such that the controller can come to an expectant result. Because in the case of a maze, if your model-based predictive controller can't look further than, say, a few steps, it won't know that if it goes in this direction, it's going to get caught in a corner. It will just see, okay, that gets me to a somewhat of an expected result. It doesn't have the experience that, okay, I might be nearer to the door, but there's a wall there. Because in order to save uh, co uh, computational time, you've limited its horizon to that step. Obviously, this gets a bit more complex when you start looking at um, lin uh, analog systems or uh, say linear time invariant systems where you might have a controller running at one, let's say one kilohertz, and your system has a dynamic of one hertz or something like that, so, or slow or faster dynamics. These sorts of things can influence how you design this optimizer and how it can be numerically solved. And so where in reinforcement learning, the desired system behavior is solely re represented by that single scalar function. However, MPC, you can directly take into account constraints, limitations and everything to that account. And so what we have over here is the basic principle of reinforcement learning, uh, sorry, model-based predictive control, at least what a model-based predictive controller will utilize. So a model-based predictive control starting at this point will say, looking ahead into the future, if what I have to do is follow this red line, I need to perform these steps such that my yellow line comes to this point. And doing this, it will be aware at all times, okay, I cannot actuate further than one or minus one, for example. It might say, okay, I can only go to full throttle or no throttle. And so it's able to take these things into account as well as, okay, I can't go over the speed limit. And all of these come together and it's able to minimize the task such that it minimizes its error. A reinforcement learning controller will say, based on everything I've experienced in the past, based on everything I've seen that's happened, I can then infer what will happen or what will lead to a better decision in the next step. So model-based predictive controllers are generally forward-based looking controllers, whereas reinforcement learning is experience-based looking controllers. So in a way, it looks backwards and says, what happened in the past and can I apply that to the future? Whereas uh, model-based predictive control needs to be explicitly given a model. And so when it comes to a comparison or a side-to-side -side comparison of the two, model-based predictive control, you want to minimize the cost. You want to achieve whatever it is you want to do, minimizing whatever the cost you might associate with that. So for example, you might say, I want, if I want to drive somewhere, I want to do it in a fuel-efficient way. And you can include these without exceeding the speed limit, without crashing into a tree. And a model-based controller can take all of these things into account. A reinforcement learning agent, however, is designed to maximize its return. So it's trying to get the best result out of the environment. A priori model, of course, model-based predictive control, you need one. And this is where most of your engineering design goes into when you are talking about model-based predictive control problems. How do you create that model? How complex does that model need to be? All these things take into, uh, all influence the effectiveness of your model-based predictive controller. With reinforcement learning, you don't necessarily need a full complete model. A very basic understanding of the system information will help you. And so one of the things that we will get, that you will learn in one of the later 
uh, examples, I think it's less, uh, somewhere around seven, uh, is features. So designing features, so using expert model, uh, knowledge, can you then provide the agent with more observations or higher level observations that help it better understand the problem? So it's not necessarily a model, but it's an indicator. Whereas if you're doing MPC, you need a full model. It needs everything. Without these factors, it just can't compute an effective solution. So pre-knowledge integration, um, it's generally easy. Once you've got the model, you put it in. Um, choosing what knowledge you put into reinforcement learning, as we said, that is its own task. Constraint handling, MPC inherently understands its constraints. It knows about trees and rocks and speed limits and everything else. Reinforcement learning, it sort of has to bump into them to figure out that there's a wall there. So take that into account. Adaptivity, MPC cannot handle changes. If the environment differs from its model, it doesn't work as effectively as it used to. The common example is driving your car. If you have an MPC controller that's trained to drive a Volkswagen and you drop it into a Formula One car, you ain't going to have a good time. Whereas with reinforcement learning, it is able to inherently adapt to the problem and, the, and its environment and learn from the experience it's going to get in order to improve itself. Complexity. <sighs> They're both really complex. MPC generally relies on using some form of optimizer. These things are highly complex, high degrees of freedom, multiple iterations needed and take a lot of computer time. Reinforcement learning can be complex, can be uh, simple. For example, if you've got a table, tabular problems, which you will encounter in the next few weeks, that's simple. It's very memory efficient. You've got a limited number of spaces. However, when we get into the later problems and the later um, topics such deep learning, Q learning, stuff like this, when you now have these large complex networks with 10,000 parameters which need to all be tuned and in order to arrive at an optimal solution, that's also somewhat inefficient. So they're both complex. And when it comes to stability, MPC is a very well-defined field of stability theorems. It's very easy to say whether or not an MPC controller will be stable or not. It's mathematically definable, whereas reinforcement learning is in its infinite infancy and it's constantly being updated. So you might eventually get to a solution and some things like what we're having more recently in the lab is we sometimes have agents that somehow forget their policy. We're not exactly going to get into that and why that happens because we're still trying to learn that and that's a field of research. And so stability in terms of reinforcement learning isn't necessarily there yet. However, MPC is largely a bit more of a mature field. It's been around for a few more years. It's reinforcement learning is only, yeah, it's been around for the same time, but it's only with more advanced computing power like what we have today that it's really taking off. So nowadays, that laptop on the desk is more power than computer from the 1980s, and they were still doing model-based predictive control in the 1980s. So there are limitations to the reinforcement learning, and so the stability criteria aren't quite there yet. So, uh, yeah, just before we perform a summary, because there were some people that arrived late, um, I just want to quickly cover how the lecture is going to be handled. So um, for those that have already heard it, I apologize, but just quickly. Um, from next week, there's no more lectures. The lecture videos are available online, so you can freely go through them at your own uh, discrepancy and time, however you want to. You will the, there will be a Zoom call at, starting at 2 p.m. The Zoom link should be available via Panda. Please make sure you've got access to that before the time. If not, send us an email on that point. If you don't have access to Panda, the Panda course, please write one of us an email. Tell us, uh, send us your information and we'll contact you and get back and we'll get you into that Panda course as soon as possible. This Q&A session will be not recorded. It's for your, it's your opportunity to ask questions. So please come with questions. And thereafter, there will be the exercise, which hopefully you should have prepared before the time. And so you can sit there and interact with the exercise in the best possible way that you can learn and take information from it. Osmosis doesn't help you learn. Experience does. And then last, so yeah, that's it. So in summary, 
We're in, um, under, we should have, or at least I should have at least tried to introduce you to how to understand the role of reinforcement learning at least in its total, in the total world of machine learning and AI and optimal decision making. Um, you should be acquainted with the reinforcement learning interaction loop, which is action, the environment update state, you get an observation, a reward, the, the agent then takes that and produces an action. You should be acquainted, you should then have some idea of some of the vocabulary we are going to use. You should understand or at least have some impression of what happens and why the reward function is important and how a proper reward function can change your results. You should be able to differentiate the solution based on basically your problem formulation. So you should at least have some idea, okay, there are these different forms that the problem can take. There's discrete, there's continuous space, there's periodic, there's uh, continuous states, uh, continuous problems. And yeah, you should be able to differentiate the difference between what reinforcement learning does and its strengths and weaknesses, at least at a surface level from uh, model-based predictive control. And yeah, that's our introductory lesson. I hope I've at least given you guys something to think about, something that would maybe motivate you to continue with this course and engage with it in a proactive fashion. It's really worthwhile. And yeah, if there's any questions, uh, feel free to ask them.